One thing that all these sources talked about was that there were these androgynous crater gods that essentially there's natural evolution. The fossil record shows that we understand it, but at the same time there seems to be um, possibly a genetic, genetic intervention to, to uh, create Homo sapiens. Now that sounds like a, a wild idea. I know some people have talked about this uh, in the past. But I've come to, to believe there might be some truth in this. And the idea is that at first, you know, there's an involution that occurred in time and space where I will get into the metaphysics of all these teachings that the world is a screen, a movie screen, a secondary manifestation that quantum mechanics is, is catching up with now. And that we basically descended into matter and forgot. And now we're renting these bodies for 70, 80, 90 years. And we don't really understand our true nature. That's, that's the old know thyself. So I will get into that at the end, and hopefully uh, you'll, you'll remain for that. <laughs> but androgynous created gods were talked about by many people, like Manly P. Hall. The mythologies of many nations contain accounts of gods who came out of the sea. Certain shamans among the American Indians tell of holy men dressed in bird feathers and wampum who rose out of the blue waters and instructed them in the arts and crafts among the legends of the Chaldeans is that of Oannes, a partly amphibious creature who came out of the sea and taught the savage peoples along the shore to read and write, till the soil, cultivate herbs for healing, study the stars, establish rational forms of government, and became conversant with the sacred mysteries. So you'll see that there are these androgynous, amphibious gods that are like half fish, half man, that instruct people all around the world after the flood in the arts of civilization. Now that sounds bizarre, but I will show the strange and specific nature of it and how all these extremely sophisticated cultures point to the culture heroes being these type of beings. Now androgynous amphibious is quite specific. So H.V. Hilprecht at the University of Pennsylvania said this, he was one of the first Sumerian explorers. This androgynous nature, this ability to beget out of himself, his own ego, the self-existence is inherent in each and every god of the Sumerians. All Sumerian gods are androgynous. That mean, androgynous in this context means a sexless being who reproduces almost in a supernatural fashion. <clears throat> and that's what Casey said as well about this. Now here's a guy, um, Oannes. He has the outward appearance of, of a male, uh, but he is considered androgynous. Now that isn't contested by academics. They're not going to say, I really believe this fish god was real and androgynous. But all the... Um, ancient descriptions of these beings are that they are amphibious and androgynous. And he shows up Samaria. So stories such as the legend, the Oannes legend, deserve more critical studies than have been performed heretofore. Carl uh, Sagan actually said that. So this is from um, The Serious Mystery by Robert Temple. So an anadotis, or the anadoti, and the mascaris are called the repulsive ones and the abominations. So that's what they call these fish gods who, who created this culture in Samaria. If anything argued, uh, ever argued for the authenticity of their account, it was the Babylonian tradition that the amphibians, who they owed everything, were disgusting and horrible and loathsome to look upon. A more normal course for any invented tradition of the origins of civilization would have been to glorify the, sp uh, the splendid gods and heroes who founded it. So temp Temple is saying, basically, this culture is wildly sophisticated in pointing to this repulsive looking god um, as their founder. Now here is Dagon, the Philistine god, breasts and a beard showing the androgynous nature and a, a fish god who was revered as well by the Philistines. Now here's Oannes again, he carries this strange bag which I'll talk about. The Dogon people in Africa and Mali uh, are a particularly interesting piece of this puzzle. For they told two French anthropologists in the 30s that the Nomo, amphibious, androgynous beings from the star system Sirius, visited them, created humanity, and taught them the arts of civilization in all this star knowledge that Robert Temple talks about in the Sirius Mystery. So another culture that has these fish beings showing up that are androgynous. Here are the Nomo here with the fish tails. Uh, here's a Nomo statue, see the male and the female? the twin, the androgynous one. Now, Fu Shi in China in 3222, I'm sorry, 3322 BC shows up. Androgynous, amphibious, fish god, culture hero of the Chinese. 
that teaches the arts of civilization. Mathematics, geometry, cultivation of herbs and plants, laws, uh, spiritual principles. Once again, just like Viracocha in Peru, which I'll, who I'll get into. So on the tombs, here you have uh, the Chinese tombs, you have Fu Xi giving birth to some strange being in the middle here. Has the square, they are considered the, the geomancers, the mathematicians, the, the markers of, of heaven and the measurers of the celestial spheres and the earth. The Chinese have always maintained that their civilization was founded by an amphibious being with a human's head and a fish tail named Fu Xi. The date traditionally ascribes is 3322 BC. So here, here you go again, you have five different beings um, shown with Fu Xi that are amphibious. There's even a temple to Fu Xi, and the Chinese people still celebrate this culture hero as the bringer of this incredible knowledge, and we know how sophisticated the Chinese civilization is. Then you go over to Africa, and Olukun is an amphibious, androgynous god that teaches the arts of civilization, and people in Nigeria still do uh, ceremonies and have uh, this reverence for this being, this fish god who came out of the ocean to teach them. Here's Ola Kuhn here. With the, the, these two tails shows up uh, all around the world too. The two-tailed merman, uh, mer mermaid, Mulzine, uh, all around the world you find this. I knew it was a conspiracy. <laughs> right? Matse in India, same thing. The first incarnation of Vishnu, Vishnu shows up as a fish god that teaches the arts of civilization. Pretty specific, documented all throughout history, revered. It seems like just a total freak show that you have these, this is what all these cultures are saying. And I'm not, you know, I, I think there's an interesting story here. I'm just stepping back and, and displaying what has been said over and over again. So in the Hari Purana, the god Vishnu is shown to have assumed the form of, of a fish with a human head in order to reclaim the Vedas lost during the deluge. Vishnu remained with them for some time and gave them instruction. As he was half man and half fish, he used to return to the ocean at every sunset and pass the night there, which is interesting. That's the account of Bibarosis of Oannes in Sumeria. He would teach men and women during the day and would sleep in the Red Sea at night. And you go over to Peru, and then you have Veracocha, who is an uh, androgynous god, once again, taught the, the arts of civilization. He has fish scales right there. He's considered to be a hybrid being. Veracocha said, this is from Wikipedia, if ever my subjects were to see me, they would run away. Basically, he was always portrayed as some, some strange hybrid creature. Uh, this is from JJ, thank you JJ. In the Olmec culture, you have these mermen, these mermaids, these fish gods. In fact, the Olmec have uh, seven androgynous gods. One is a fish god. On the fifth day, this is from the Popol Vuh, they were paired again and they were seen in the water by the people. Both had the appearance of fishmen. That's this, uh, the sacred uh, Kichi Mai text, uh, the, the Popol Vuh. Uh, Quetzalcoatl. He has this fish-like protrusion on the back. He is known to be androgynous, offspring of the androgynous god Omitiotl, and he's carrying the strange man bag. So another man, uh, man bag carrying androgynous being on the other side of the Atlantic is teaching civilization to humanity after a deluge. And here's Kukulkan, the androgynous god with a bag, with fish scales, and the seven-headed serpent which is the, uh, the marker of this, this divine law of one, this holographic metaphysical system that I will talk, to, talk about at the end of, of the talk. Oannes once again has this strange bag on the other side of the Atlantic. And this is what Barosus specifically says about Oannes. He made them distinguish from the seas of the earth and show them how to collect the fruits. And when the sun had set, this being Oannes retired again to the sea and passed the night in the deep, for he was amphibious. That is pretty specific. The being was accustomed to pass the day among men, but took no food at that season, and he gave them an insight into letters and sciences and arts of every kind. He taught them to construct cities, to found temples, to compile laws, and explain to them the principles of geometrical knowledge, which is quite interesting, because I could show many examples of the complex mathematical and geometrical systems of the Sumerians, including this one. A cuneiform tablet was found 
I think this is from Nineveh, about 100 years ago, and it's never been deciphered until a couple of years ago. And what was revealed on this tablet, this, this cuneiform tablet, was our research reveals that Plimpton 322 describes the shapes of right angle triangles using a novel kind of trigonometry based on ratios, not angles and circles, Mansfield said. It is a fascinating mathematical work that demonstrates undoubted genius. Now, who was supposed to have delivered this knowledge? Oh, Honest did. And I got to tell an interesting story. I'm working on my PowerPoint last night, and I'm watching Man in the High Castle on uh, Amazon. If you've ever seen it, it's a really good uh, series. So this woman, the, the trade minister from Japan, is killed. And the, one of the lead characters go, kind of goes into a meditative state to interface with him in this, this kind of uh, in-between world. And I'm thinking about the fact that Fuxi, and I'm writing about it and putting the slide up, that Fuxi in China created the hexagram and trigram system of the I Ching, the complex divination system. If you've ever used the I Ching, it, it basically, within time and space, taps into the holographic nature of reality in past and present to divine and guide you. So I'm working on this, and then on the show, she goes to the trade minister who writes the 64th hexagram in the sand. And you can go check it, you know, I, I hate testimonials because, you know, most, they're pretty fake. But this was a reality. As I was doing this, the, trek, the, the hexagram is written in the sand and it just struck me in the oddest way and really kind of verified the point that this system, like all these gods, all these enlightened beings throughout history, Buddha, Lao Tzu, uh, Ramana Maharshi, they all had this prophetic vision to look into the past and the future and they understood the holographic nature of reality. So this is a weird example to me of, of the, the nature of this system. The extremely complex hexagram system of 64 hexagrams was specifically noted to be created by Fuxi, the androgynous amphibious god. And in fact, he got it through interfacing with another amphibious god who came from um, the Yellow River and slept there at night. And also, there is a line and a sequence called the Fuxi sequence within the, uh, the system. <coughs> And here it is again, or <laughs> it is again. So what kind of more strange verification for the story. At Lipinski, uh, Serbia, this is from 7 to 9,000 BC. They recently found these um, strange fish-like beings and archeologists don't know what to make of it. Enki in Samaria was Ea in Babylon. And he was also uh, considered a fish being who lived in a watery vault, <coughs> an underwater palace like many of these beings. So the story is, is goes back and interfaces with Christianity where you see the, the, the fish god is, is um, shown to us on, on a Christian staff head here. And you'll see that Christianity has a lot of weird intertwined um, iconography around this idea of the fish god. Now yeah, this seems like <laughs> quite strange but there is this connection. There's a biblical connect, uh, connection to Dagon I will talk about in a minute. Um, the Greeks had their own gods who were amphibious and androgynous. We even know from Plutarch that the earliest representations of Zeus were of a man with a fish tail, an image which survived in Greek mythology in the form of his brother Poseidon. So once again, all throughout the Middle East and the world, you find these fish gods associated with the tree of life and people like Uhuru Mazda in strange crafts in the sky. Uh, at Ashad, there was a temple to Dagon. In Gaza and Ashad, there were two temples, Philistine temples. And when the Philistines brought the ark to the temple, this is what happened. After the Philistine, Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it to Ebenezer, to Ashad, carried it into the temple of Dagon, and set it beside the statue. When the people of Ashad got up early the next morning, there was Dagon falling on his face before the Ark of the Lord, and the head and the arms were broken off of this fish guard. Just to show you, well, first of all, it's a pretty strange story that the Ark of the Covenant had some effects on the, the statue of the fish guard, but in the Bible, they also talk about the pagan worship of this god. So in Plato's Symposium, Aristophanes displays knowledge of the ancient, ancient myth of the androgen according to which our original nature was by no means the same as it is now. When the androgen, androgen was split into two halves, the distinct male and female sexes were created. So Plato talks about a great flood 
Atlantis, ancient androgyny, and the holographic nature of reality, which I'll talk about. All things that, you know, everything else, like all Western thought is footnotes to Plato, as Alfred uh, White, Whitehead North once said. But we don't listen when he says these things. And they line up with all the mystical accounts, all the esoteric and secret society accounts. The idea that we were once androgynous and basically we've descended into matter. And here is an amphora that shows where Zeus splits the male and the female. References to a race of androgens which once inhabited the world occur in the midst of both East and West. In the Western traditions, this primar primordial androgen is to be found in the writings of certain Kabbalists, Gnostics, Neoplatonists, Swedenborgians, and Theosophists. Here is a list of some of the androgynous gods found around the planet. Many of them are familiar, like Veracocha. The Gnostics have an androgynous god. And co according to the Zunis, a Native American tribe, for example, the Burdock was assigned the role of what Baum calls androgynous gods in the ritual reenactment of the tribal myth. Many Native cultures have a reverence towards uh, the two-spirit people, gay, lesbian, transsexual people, where the Western model, the Columbus showing up, with the, the um, kind of a, a malevolent look at, at people who are, are differently gendered um, or are gay and lesbian. And the two spirits were revered. Now, Wiwa was, was a man dressed as a woman. And in Zuni uh, traditions, the, the, uh, the burdocks, they, they chose the names of the warriors. They were considered closer to our original aspect. They had a more open communication with the divine, if you will. So we have a different orientation in Native American societies than the Western Christian model that, that uh, is, is really you know, quite lame. Uh, so he shows up, or she shows up, at the White House uh, to meet the president because uh, uh, Wee Wah was an ambassador from the Zuni people. And all the newspapers talk about, I'll put him back, uh, a Native princess showing up. They didn't know that it was a guy dressed as a woman. And, and that, that's kind of the disconnect in our, in our Western culture. But I just found it, the, the story fascinating because all the native tribes have the same legend of an androgynous god and our original state being androgynous. So here, uh, sober academic Eric Ziffer in his paper explores the androgynous created deities in his paper, The First Adam, Androgyny in the Ayin Gazelle Two-Headed Bus. Now, Ayin Gazelle is a site in... Jericho, I think, I'm sorry, in Jordan, 8250 BC. And he is talking about these two headed statues representing androgynous deities. This academic wrote this paper about it. And it's very interesting. Here they are in the British Museum. Uh, and interestingly, a six toed foot was found in one of the statues. Now, what we find is some of the oldest statues in the world, like at Jericho and Ayin Ghazal, show androgyny and polydactylism, extra digits which lines up with the Samuel 2120 account of the giant of Gath, who had six fingers and toes, 24 digits in all. I would like, this is from Ziffer. I would like to suggest that the statues represented mythical ancestors from the dawn of mankind, and that the two-headed busts among them represent the first human being, the androgynous prototype of humanity. So he's not saying, I fully buy this story, but he knows what they're trying to represent. Maybe these, these ignorant people are, are praying to androgynous gods with six fingers and toes. Uh, but it, I think it's quite startling. Uh, Col Tepe, you find the, this iconography all around the world of the two-headed androgynous statue. Janus, the Roman god. Boa Island in Ireland, you have the two-headed androgynous god. Female on one side, male on the other. Here's a couple androgynous freaks at the... Uh, Museum in Mexico City. This is the Olmec androgynous god, one of many. Humano asexuado. If you looked at my love life, I'm doing a good job trying to be androgynous. Yeah. Um, the Temple of Ezna in Egypt is another interesting um, part of the story where the androgynous god, Kanum Ra, Kanum, is creating humans on a potter's wheel. And, and that's a ubiquitous myth across the world. The Temple of Ezna was dedicated to an androgynous, nameless, omnipotent creator god, which manifested itself as both Kanum and Kanum Ra. That's from the Encyclopedia of Egyptology. Here is Kanum creating humans on a potter's wheel. 
He has six fingers, one, two, three, four, five, six. Greek, Sumerian, Babylonian, Laotian, Native American, Maori, Yoruba, Christian, and Muslim sources all claim humans were created out of the clay in supernatural fashion. That's even talked about in the Bible. Now here is Thoth and Kanum creating humans. And Fushi Nua, this androgynous being, is also attributed with the creation of humans in China. Viracocha, the androgynous hybrid god that teaches the arts of sciences, is specifically noted to have created humans out of clay and genetic intervention. At the top of the cosmological order was the androgynous divinity Viracocha. Pachacuti Yamqui leaves no doubt as to Viracocha's sexual duality, just to show you that th this, is, uh, this idea of androgyny associated with these gods is not... Um, uh, well, it's, it's acknowledged by academics is what I'm trying to say. You know. Whether they believe it or not, it's, it's specifically stated all throughout history. He has six fingers here, Viracocha, uh, as a hybrid in a German museum. <laughs> Explain that one, Linus in the, ca in, in the sink. I, I got home the other day, and he's sitting there. I know. <laughs> I, I'm a weirdo. I, I always tell the story. I used to have 17 cats, my brother and I. I love cats. We took in a bunch, and so... Uh, I'm, like, uh, I'm like a worshiper of Sekhmet, let's put it that way. So at Gobekli Tepe, this, Andrew might be interested in this, um, there are academics who are starting to believe that the T-shaped pillars may be representations of androgynous gods as well. Now I'll show you this, I'll walk through this. First of all, there's some um, con controversy whether these are these man bags that not, or not up here. Um, you know, we'll kind of leave that there. That might be an interesting thing when they excavate more. If they found a, wine, a wing being at Gobekli Tepe with a, a man bag, I will fully buy it. But anyways, this is what Hancock, Graham Hancock had to say about the site. To me, the notion that a group of hunter-gatherers woke up one morning and invent megalithic architecture, the world's largest megalithic site, and at the same moment invent agriculture stretches credulity a bit. And I think I would prefer to propose, that, I, as I have proposed, that we're looking at a evidence of some kind of transfer of technology. Now, the oldest sites are the most sophisticated at Gobekli Tepe, 11,600-year si uh, old temple site in Turkey, the largest megalithic construction on the planet to date. And it's kind of in reverse. You would think that there would be an evolution. You know, I'm a stone mason with engineering expertise. It would, you would see something different, in my estimation. It does look like a transfer of technology. Uh, the verdict isn't in yet, but it's a very, very interesting idea. So at Navali Chori, you have these, uh, this is somewhat contemporaneous with, with uh, Gobekli Tepe, but you have these statues of these beings, some think androgynous, with the hands around the navel, around the waist. Now this is from Gaziantep, 6500 BC. This is the Nomo of the Dogon. These are both androgynous statues. This is in the Turkey region. So once again, Eric Ziffer is talking about this in his paper where he alludes to the fact that Gobekli Tepe's pillars may be androgynous gods. This is, um, why is this, Gaziantep? No. Karl Hayuk. Mark Verhoeven, 2001, is an academic who wrote a paper about a statue found at the foot of the Taurus Mountains in Kilisic. This is from 10,000 BC contemporaneous with Gobekli Tepe, and he indicated this was an androgynous statue. Now look at the iconography and the similarity to Gobekli Tepe and Navali Chori, uh, this the, Urfa man on the right. Now I am saying, even if Gobekli Tepe isn't iconographically displaying this androgynous aspect, there are statues that are in the same time frame showing this androgynous aspect. The point is the oldest statues in the world are displaying this idea of ancient androgyny as this cult worship of our creators or our first state, which I find very interesting. <coughs> now, in the Sicily Channel at 130 feet down, they recently found a 40-foot-long megalith that's at least 10,000 years old. And that's one of our questions that Hugh and I and others keep asking, like, where did the megalith builders start from? And this is a particularly interesting site that I hope to dive on and explore. Uh, so there's a lot that, that's coming forward uh, with new scientific research and satellite archaeology that hopefully will allow us to answer these questions. Now, my buddy Richard Cassaro studies something called the God Self Icon. It's called the Master of Animals or the, the, um, 
the master of staffs all around the world. You have these mostly androgynous gods all around the world engaged in this balance of the opposites, god self icon. Now, I would argue it's part of an ancient metaphysical system that was passed on after the flood. Uh, but, you know, we'll get into that. You can make up your own mind. What is very apparent, it is quite ubiquitous and quite specific. And you find it in really specific uh, places, like over the temple uh, gates. You find this kind of strange megalith building with these knobs all around the world. Androgynous Viracocha is engaged in this posture. <coughs> Peru and Egypt, many similarities, two snakes, one snake, God self icon, above the doorways, esoteric traditions, the Freemason, Freemasons and Rosicrucians kind of uh, esoterically transmitted this knowledge in secret throughout the Dark Ages, so they wouldn't be burned to death, basically, uh, and it shows the same iconography that I'm talking about, this balance of the op opposites. In fact, recently in India, they found this, this god self icon, the oldest one in the world. The discovery of rock carvings believed to be tens of thousands of years old greatly excited archaeologists who believe they hold clues to a previously unknown civilization. Now, they didn't pick up on the fact that it's a god self icon. Richard did. But just another interesting corroborative piece of evidence. Now, you have on the other side of the Atlantic, once again, the uh, god Kukulkan, who has the seven heads, the seven-headed serpent. Now, Manly P. Hall, Madame Blavatsky, all the mystics talk about this ancient serpent wisdom, the seven-headed serpent, embodying the seven energy systems in the body and the transformative secret teachings that allow you to liberate yourself from over-identification with the body, with the temporary existence. So it's a metaphysical thought system taught around the world, I'll show. And the seven-headed serpent shows up with these wisdom bringings, the, these divine beings. Uh, Siberia, you find it as a shamanic um, seven-headed being. Even King Arthur fights the seven-headed dragon. The dragons and the serpents were the wisdom bringers. The druids were called the, dra uh, the serpents. In fact, St. Patrick drove the serpents out of Ireland, although there's no snakes in Ireland. In 1200 BC, he destroyed the old pagan belief system and took like a Gnostic esoteric teaching uh, of Christianity and turned it into a literal Christianity that we have today. In Samaria, you have the same findings. The Nagas, the seven-headed uh, serpent, protected Buddha. So you find the specific iconography around the world. In the Book of Revelation, you find it as well. Medieval tapestries, pretty specific. The Gnostics, in fact, have their own seven-headed dragon. That's from the book of Revelation. Now, with Chichen Itza, Hugh and I went a couple years ago, and I was drawn to the, the big ball court. And I said, okay, I wonder what's over there. So I went under the hoop, and what I found was this guy is nailing, and seven serpents are coming out of his head. And then I went over to the other hoop, and the same thing that there are seven serpents. Now, the belief is, oh, this guy was decapitated and this is blood. And I was kind of amazed, but then I found that I wasn't the first one to make this discovery or research it. In fact, Hunbat's men, the Mayan wisdom keeper said uh, that he concluded that the Mayan religion was based around a system of seven energy centers similar to the Hindu chakras. He also notes that the Buddha was bitten by a seven-headed serpent at the river of initiation. So th this number seven shows up and Hunbat's men, who's unfortunately passed away, specifically noted the iconography at the Mayan ball court at Chichen Itza as an example of this. So once again, on the other side of the Atlantic, you find the same iconography, basically trying to convey this metaphysical thought system that Madame Blavatsky, Manly P. Hall, and others trace all the way back to Atlantis. The serpent is called, this is Hun Batsman again, called Chapa in India. Curiously, the people of Yucatan have the same word for it, and it refers to the seven-headed serpent, just as in India. So psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally, culturally lay down models of behavior and information processing. They open the door to the possibility that everything you know is wrong, so I'm a, personally a psychonaut. I've done many ayahuasca, San Pedro, psilocybin ceremonies with shamans in North and South America. Basically, these substances have been demonized. 
they're essentially plant medicines, and our Western mindset is that it, it is drug taking or fantasy or, or escapism, which none of it is. It's a very, very difficult thing that, you know, I don't require, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't advocate that people do this uh, lightly. If you're going to do ceremonies with shamans, it takes lots of years of self reflection, meditation, fasting, and to pre prepare the way to be able to experience these states that are brought about by hallucinogens. So I, I tie this in because this hallucinogenic cult, if you will, is part of this esoteric mystery school. All the esoteric mystery schools who taught this metaphysical thought system that I will get into in a second use psychedelics to do so. Now, one of the translators of the Dead Sea Scrolls was a Cambridge scholar named John Allegro, and he was the only non-conservative Catholic who, who um, went through the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you know the whole story, the church held the, the scrolls back for years because they told a different version of reality that, that Jesus taught. Jesus taught that the immortality of the soul, reincarnation was a reality. Essentially that this is a secondary manifestation from a quantum grid outside of time and space that I'll get into. So he had all these very um, difficult and complex uh, thoughts about the world that don't make for good, you know, large scale religion. Because metaphysic and spiritual work are a lot about in, inner work that takes a lot of time. And it's not good for the masses, frankly. It doesn't get the crowds involved. You know? So it's basically uh, spirituality is a personal thing with a connection with something larger. That, that's what the mystics would say. So Allegro talks about the, the uh, interaction of psychedelics with the, with the early Christian cults that blossomed into kind of an underground movement within Christianity. So you have the Amanita muscaria, psychedelic uh, substance, found in a 12th century tapestry in a church in France, right here. <laughs> now I'll show you many examples of this. What is being displayed is between 350 to AD to about 1400. You find psilocybin and Amanita displayed all throughout uh, the Christian world in churches and tapestries. Right here, God is creating um, Plants on the fourth day, that's Amanita, psilocybin, psilocybin, psilocybin. Now, Brown, uh, Julian Jerry Brown wrote this wonderful book about the psychedelic gospels. I recommend it if you're interested in the subject. And you can't believe these old uh, tapestries and Psalters and, and um, even Notre Dame, the grandest cathedrals of Christianity around Europe all have psilocybin and Amanita muscara all over the place unmistakable, taxonomically accurate. Here is Amanita right here. 350 AD, uh, a church in Turkey. Here is psilocybin. Look at what the, deci the uh, disciples are looking at. They're staring at the mushrooms, which is quite funny. Uh, here, Jesus uh, rides into Jerusalem. See all the psilocybin, and they're cutting it. And at the Last Supper, he's cutting it Here's the knife, and here are the pieces of psilocybin that Jesus is giving out to the disciples. The belief being that he is basically a shaman who is leading uh, his disciples in this activity that interfaces with the divine, uh, which is quite, quite intriguing. And I could say, you know, with all the ceremonies I've done, that the ego is put to sleep, and you do interface with something larger. And it's a personal experience, but it's quite, uh, quite compelling. Here, Jesus is displayed as a mushroom. Um, and, and some of the most, um, you know, they, they, God, Jesus, Mary Magdalene, some of the, the largest characters in Christianity are associated with the psilocybin and the Amanita. Right here is Jesus. Psilocybin, Amanita. God creates psychedelics on the fourth day. <laughs> Uh, and this is all for hundreds and hundreds of years throughout the history of Christianity, hidden in plain sight. And when the Inquisition started after the plague, there was a scapegoat, which was kind of the pagan leftover belief in the esoteric Christianity. So the horn god of the shaman became Satan, and psychedelics were turned into the demonized aspect that we have today. Now, most people are kind of squeamish. I, you know, I'm pretty loose about psychedelics at this point because uh, I'm a freak, but, you know, we, we have these really puritanical views of them, and they're plant medicines. Uh, they're not addictive. They, they, uh, I'll, I'll get into the new science around them, too, but it's actively being displayed in these uh, churches around the world. 
and here Adam and Eve, and the serpent of wisdom, Enki in Samaria, is the serpent, the dragon, the wisdom keeper, who's trying to say to Adam and Eve, this is a false universe, wake up from it. Rather than the Christian belief, you're going to burn in hell forever. You know, it's a different, it's an esoteric, not a literal view of, of Christianity. And even in the Orthodox churches around Europe, you have the Amanita in the doorway, quite specific. Now, Stefan uh, Borhegi was a Mayan archaeologist who worked with Gordon Wasson. And Wasson wrote about the, the same um, thing in, in um, psychedelic use through the cults of Europe and in, in Mesoamerica. So in Guatemala, you have these uh, mushroom cults, if you will, Jalisco culture, Olmecs, Mochi, Jalisco. Here is a, a Christian um, post-contact um, rendering of psilocybin use right here, but it's a, uh, it's a puritanical view of it where the person eating the flesh of the gods, the psilocybin, is confronted by a demon because it was viewed as uh, a demonic practice. And you, you find the same um, iconography about this around the world with psilocybin in India, associated with Buddha and enlightenment in Jesus. Do, 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 do. Ishtar in Samaria, Inanna actually, is the leader of this great cult. And here are mushrooms coming forth, psilocybin. And all the ancient mystery schools Kaikion was used in the Aleutian Mysteries, and, and all the mystery schools used DMT, psilocybin, and what it did was, it puts the, I'll just explain, it puts the rational ego self, the operating software of the body to sleep, so you can really experience what you are in reality. That's the best way to describe it. Now, in day-to-day -day life, it's like, oh, that's interesting, oh shit, what time is it, oh, I gotta eat. There's like this we over-identify with the, with, the, with the secondary manifestation of the separate self, right? The operating software of the body, which you need, but we over-identify it and we lose our divine connection is the thought, which I tend to believe. So these substances put that part to sleep and it reveals to you the, kind of this glorious divine connection. And uh, here uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you see the mushrooms. I wanna know what this dude's doing crawling up the tree, but that's a different matter. So you find this all over the, all over the planet, uh, and it's, it's just a, a fascinating story. This is from Tazili, Niger in Algeria, a super ancient shamanic bee-faced being who is a medicine man with psilocybin. This is what happens when you take psilocybin. <laughs> so this is the new science out about psychedelics now, about magic mushrooms. Uh, a psychedelics, the new wonder drug for mental illness and the fear of death. Anderson Cooper just did this great story with Johns Hopkins scientist on 60 Minutes about it. Uh, Michael Pollan has a book about it. Magic mushrooms could be a psychiatric wonder drug. Are psychedelics the wonder drug we've been waiting for? I'll just say I had a traumatic brain injury when I was playing football and a brutal seizure disorder for like 20 years and I would have waves of grand mal and petty mal seizures and my whole world was painted gray for weeks. I couldn't crack a smile. Severe, severe depression. And I took Depakote and Dilantin. And I, I, I basically tried to mitigate in different ways. But then I started an alternative approach, which was the use of ayahuasca and psilocybin. And now, it's been about 15 years, I have no medication, no seizures, not even an aura of a seizure in 15 years, all medically documented. Now, I'm not a big testimonial guy, like I said, but you know, my personal experience is like, whoa, there is something that's rewiring the brain in these substances, and that is what science is telling us now. So psilocybin, the active ingredient in shrooms, is looking more and more like a potential wonder drug. You take this large dose and your, your depression is mitigated for like eight to 10 months. It's, it's like nothing uh, pharmacology has ever seen. They have mind-blowing potential to uh, treat depression. In fact, Johns Hopkins is opening a $17 million research center, which is great. Now, all this ties up into what all the mystics said about the nature of reality. 
Now, I read this book by Michael Talbot years ago, and it was fascinating, The Holographic Universe, and it really starts to answer a lot of questions about people's psychic abilities and, and uh, things that seem very um, strange to us existing here in you know, what we think is one fixed point in time and space. Now, Talbot says, there is evidence to suggest that our world and everything in it, from snowflakes to maple trees to falling stars and spinning electrons, are only ghostly images, projections from a level of reality so beyond our own, it is literally beyond time and space. Now, I want to get to Brian Greene for a second, because he said the same thing about quantum mechanics, catching up to this, idea, this mystical idea. Now, physicist Brian Greene, he has a four-part special on PBS about like, the fabric of the co cosmos. He's a theoretical uh, physicist. He explains the properties of the black hole surface as event horizon, suggesting the unsettling theory that our world is a mere representation of another universe, a shadow of the realm where real events take place. That's what quantum mechanics is catching up to. And Green, in, in especially, even says that quantum physicists have realized that the universe of time and space is being projected by a quantum field outside of time and space, but they can't locate it. And they can't locate it because what all the mystics tell us is that reality is abstract. It is not concrete and specific. And the shadows on Plato's wall that we are viewing here is basically a secondary manifestation. And you cannot pinpoint outside of time and space where the um, image is, being, is coming from. That sounds a little strange, but I'm just trying to show that modern science is basically um, matching what these mystics said all throughout history. Secret societies, Plato, Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, Ramana Maharshi, Yogananda, all the masters throughout history are all saying the specific and, and strange thing about reality. And it is just that. Are we living in a hologram? You know, some people call it a virtual reality world. Plato's allegory of the cave is essentially there's a bunch of prisoners chained to a wall. They're viewing the screen of the world and thinking it's reality. One of them breaks out. He goes to the light. He experiences his divine self, his immortality. He comes back in the cave and he wants to release his brothers and sisters and they want to kill him. They're like, I have become acclimated to this delusion where I get external hits and, oh, people like me, oh, you know, like, like you try to get things in the external world rather than being at peace internally. And basically the ego, and I'm sure there's some, uh, you know, I know I'm a lunatic, but there is apprehension amongst people's ego sometimes to hear this information. It's like, I want what I want out of life, you know, this divine connection, it might sound good, but what about all of my hopes and dreams, you know? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's a secondary manifestation, a secondary reality. What we are is, is a kind of a changeless, eternal being that is immortal. And that's why I'm fascinated by ancient mysteries, because that is what all these ancient sources are saying. Now, Plato literally says the same thing about the nature of time and space. We are creatures not of earth, but of heaven, where the soul was first born, and our divine part attaches us to the head to heaven, like a plant by its roots and keeps our body upright. So I've, I've had a lot of weird trauma in my life, and I, I have always been going towards the metaphysical. I, I'm a recovering Catholic. Um, so I was an atheist for a while, too. But then I started to have these mystical experiences and all that, you know, around like uh, trauma and sickness and my parents' death and stuff like that. So I really have come around to believe there is a metaphysical underpinning to this reality. And Duncan Rhodes in Nexus Magazine wrote this wonderful introduction to an editorial that I will end with. Particle and quantum physics experiments keep showing that the physical reality is little more than a subjective visual virtual illusion, with some suggesting that the only thing that really exists in its own right is consciousness. The thing that is stumping researchers is, is who or what designed the consciousness responsive virtual world that we all take so seriously. So science has taken us down the, path, the road of realization to the point where space and time and matter are seen as subjective effects or secondary manifestations of something more real. The bravest of the scientists suggest that based on the evidence, consciousness is primary and that what seems to be reality is but a secondary manifestation. That actually seems weird, but it's the good news. The world is, and that's what happens uh, when you're oriented correctly, because the idea is there's only one collective unconscious as Jung talked about. There is only one holographic mind. So the mind training that is taught by the masters is that to judge another is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to die. 
you see something you don't like about usually an aspect of yourself and the other, you judge that and you basically transmit through the unconscious mind all these messages to yourself. So you know people like friends who are victims and they're always going on and on about the same problems rather than taking responsibility for the movie characters that they basically attract in the external world. And the correct orientation is to loop that around and just like right now, if somebody threw something at me and said, you're an idiot, I'd probably say, you're right, but uh, wow, that's interesting that I would attract that. You know, it's coming from me. You take that responsibility for the things in your life. And the, the Western model is that these are all independent actors and there is no kind of meshing of these worlds. And I, I don't believe that is true. My own experience isn't that it's true. And so um, I hope you can metabolize all that I've said. I just find this, the, the metaphysical aspects fascinating. And, and I really, um, I think a lot of people who are interested in ancient mysteries are open-minded enough to entertain ideas like this. And, and you know, it's not just a, uh, an interesting idea. With this comes a metaphysical thought system, like, like the Course in Miracles or, or you know, the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, a non-dualistic perspective that you can unravel these false beliefs about yourself. So uh, <laughs> thanks for enduring that.